Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to The Nest. It's October 21st, 2021, and I'm Jim Chu in San Francisco, California, and we're streaming live on stonks.com with entrepreneurs and investors from around the world. Our goal here on The Nest is to connect entrepreneurs and frontier markets with angel investors worldwide. We stream live every month, and all episodes are recorded and available on our website, untapped-global.com. Today, we welcome two exciting African startups to the nest with two new investors on the panel and a familiar face. Um, before we introduce everybody, a quick shout out to our co-hosts today, Invest Africa and Stonks.com. Thanks for co-hosting with us and we're, we're using this new platform, Stonks.com. Um, we love it uh, and think the audience will too. So hopefully, I'd uh, love to hear your feedback and uh, hopefully we'll continue to use that and work with Stonks again. So. Just really quickly, uh, for those of you in the audience, we do want to hear from you. We want to hear your comments and your questions so we can take advantage of your insights. So use that message box on the right, introduce yourself, talk to others watching the show, make comments and ask questions. Best of all, and I'm really excited about this, if you're an accredited investor, you can now, take, you can now make investments as you watch. It's pretty cool. Click on the button that says invest and the folks at Stonks will help you facilitate the intro and maybe even set up the roll-up vehicle. It's pretty cool. And well, you know, the emoji thing scares me a bit, but that's probably because I'm old. But all right, let's get on with it. Let's introduce the angels. Come on up. Jennifer, Ali, Sarah, welcome to the nest. Thanks. Jennifer, would you like to start with introductions since you're on the top of the screen there? Great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here today and to to hear from the two founders and you know and and uh, hear what they've got to say about their companies. And so my name is Jennifer Faust. I'm based in the Washington D.C. area, and my group is called Faust Global Partners. Great. And you've been investing in Africa for quite a long time now. That's correct. That's correct. Since about 2002. 2002. Great. Wonderful. Well, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Um, next, Ali. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for having me again. It's uh, great to be back on the Nest second time this year. Hey. <laughs> uh, amazing platform. Uh, you guys are very connecting uh, uh, startups, uh, great startups uh, in, in Africa with investors everywhere, um, uh, particularly in the West. So excited to be here. Um, I've done I've done maybe like a couple of investments in Africa. Uh, one of them through uh, 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 one, you know, one of your funds, and then uh, uh, um, I'm hoping to do more. Uh, but I am an yes. active angel investor, founder of Stonks, and uh, LP in a bunch of funds. I want to hear more about that. I mean, Stonks is, I mean, I, I think it's amazing. But what inspired you to launch Stonks? So uh, my last startup was in the live streaming space, and we built tools to uh, uh, monetize content creators. And and we learned, you know, so we paid out seven hundred and fifty million dollars to content creators in five years, and that was uh, before the creator economy was a thing. Um, and uh, these tools are now being used in e-commerce all over China and Asia. Um, and so we're applying a lot of those lessons and tools we've learned, uh, are trying to <laughs> to investing. Uh, startup investing is very fragmented, very regional, very based on who you know. And, uh, you know, we're trying to make it a little bit more open uh, and, and and give people more access. You know, everyone benefits when markets are bigger and, mm -hmm. and less barriers to entry. So so ultimately, you know, we want to democratize access to, to, to startup capital. Indeed. And, you know, we started uh, the Nest really to uh, connect more um, frontier market entrepreneurs with international investors. So I think this partnership... Uh, is great and the more like you said the bigger the market and the more connections there are the the more efficient and the more interesting things will happen so great to have you and you. then over to you sarah and sorry about the technical difficulties you know we decided to make it even more challenging um, by switching up the tech platform so sorry your camera's not working but um, we can see your picture well, that's terrific. Um, hi, everyone. I, I apologize for not being on screen, but I can see you all and I'll be listening very intently and hopefully engaging uh, orally. Um, thank you, uh, Jim, for having me on and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I see my title is Heifer International Foundation. I do sit on an endowment that invests in Africa. I've also personally uh, in professional life invested in Africa 
for quite a long time and have been tracking and following these markets. I sit on the board of an Africa fintech company right now. Uh, and so that's uh, another, another angle that I have on it. And I look forward yeah. to hearing from both companies. Well, I think I may even have heard of them. <laughs> well, I think you, so. You've been investing and sitting on boards and involved with African companies for decades now as well. Is that right? That's true. That's true. Yes, I've been. Uh, I, I got into this uh, field as uh, probably my colleague on this, Jennifer, will remember. Yeah, multiple decades ago, when everyone thought um, I was crazy, uh, and uh, back in the late '90s, actually. Uh, when uh, very little private capital was going into the emerging markets. Then we started with Asia and built out through Africa and Latin America, et cetera. And the markets have grown substantially. And we've seen now just even the fact that we're talking about startup capital and, you know, early stage for these markets is is just a really testimony to the way that the markets have developed over time and the willingness of uh, investors to see the opportunities and to uh, better understand the risks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I hate to break it to you, though. I think people still think we're crazy. So that's okay, though. Crazy is good sometimes. So glad to have you here. And uh, hopefully you'll be on the nest uh, again in the future. Well, fabulous. Um, I think we're ready to move on to the presentations. Uh, do we have Gabenga coming on first? Yes. Hi, Gabenga. Oh, hi, everybody. I'm here. Welcome to the nest. Uh, glad to have you. And where are you calling in from? Uh, Lagos, Nigeria. Lagos, fabulous, beautiful city. So quick notes, you do have five minutes to pitch and we will stop you at five minutes. So please uh, respect the time because we'll have a really good discussion afterwards for 15 and then we'll talk about uh, all the Q and A. Um, so now over to you. Okay. Um, hello everybody, thanks for having me. And Bing Godegban, the CEO, co-founder you Verify, uh, KYC automation for banks and startups. Um, at you verify, we help banks and startups automate their decisions um, and help them acquire the right customers and mitigate fraud using data. Uh, this is extremely important in Africa where data is not readily available and in some cases restricted. Um, as you, uh, in almost every country, when you try to open a business account, it does take some countries days, some countries weeks. In Africa, it's even worse. And the reason, and they spend, in Africa, they spend about, an average bank spend about three million dollars on KYC or KYB a year and in other countries even more and the reason is because there's non availability of data for for them to automate this process uh the compliance process and not um, and the unifying tool to, to, to do this is not available and that's where you verify comes in uh, we solve this problem by getting data um uh, that is um across multiple um very vast uh, diverse type of data that allow our customers to auto to achieve this in seconds and, and, and mitigate fraud at the same time. And uh, we've processed over 1.5 million applications in the last two years. And as of last month, we processed uh, over 400,000 applications from different uh, uh, customers. And our customers repeatedly come back to us because um, we are reliable and we have direct access to over 100 million IDs and other data sources that they need to automate these processes. And also, we are, they're also confident that we are regulatory compliant and, and very, very secure. Um, and, we, um, and we provide these data and services in a way that allows them to, that meets their different use cases, because all of them have different use cases in a way that our existing customers um, in our market do not offer. So and we have a very comprehensive value chain. Um, we deliver these services using two products, um, UVFI OS, which is which our customers use to automate their own body to acquire the right customers and prevent fraud. And you refer ID, which our customers use to acquire pre-screen customers. Um, and, and we will make money, customers pay us per verification. So every time they access a service, there's a fee they pay. Uh, since we've launched, um, we presently have the MRR of 88,000 US dollars and ARR of over a million dollars uh, from 40 fantastic customers. And we have a sales pipeline of over $4 million. Uh, some of our top customers uh, is Standard Bank, which is Standard Bank uh, also, and Standard Charter, Transion, both um, among others. Uh, we are presently in the process of onboarding customers like Jumia, Zenith Bank, and presently we are presently executing the project actually to provide uh, plate number recognition and resolution for traffic offenders in Lagos State. Um, since we've launched, we've had solid and consistent growth 
And um, in the last one year, we've achieved over 300% growth in our revenue in our top line. And we've also been able to sustain our margins. And the reason why we've been able to sustain our margins is because we've been able to create use cases for our customers to drive recurring verification. So if you have one identity, we uh, over the course of a year, we'll, we'll, we'll optimize it and we'll keep our customers keep uh, verifying it. And also we have strategic partnership with uh, different customers that give us preferential access to markets and our field verify ecosystem and its low code pla platform. We're a very strong team, very, very strong team and diverse team. I myself I have over 15 years providing technology for the financial industry and success in startup. Our CTO is, is, is an alum alumnus of Cambridge and she is expert at S and Della. And um, our CME uh, is an expert and leader in, in data privacy and protection. Um, so we are raising our series A round. Uh, we've been here before. Uh, our seed round was oversubscribed by the likes of Orange, uh, Lofty Inc., and Village Capital. And we're doing our series A now to raise three million dollars. Three million dollars. And right now we do about four hundred thousand verifications a, a, a month. And we want to uh, grow to one million a day, and to generate a uh, move our MR to over five hundred thousand dollars in the next twelve months. Um, and I want to make this investment in people, majorly people, market expansion and technology. Um, that's our pitch. Uh, thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much, Governor. Great timing on that uh, and great presentation and great business. Uh, over to the investors. i uh, love to hear what you guys think about the Gavanga's business, you verify. Would like to start. I'm happy to go first, Jim, if I could. First of all, um, thank you so much for taking the time to be here and to present um, to us all today. Um, certainly fintech and know your customer. These are big issues, you know, for for Africa. And so I think you're certainly trying to solve, I think, you know, a pain point um, within Africa. And um, could you give me a little bit more information kind of on your competition? I also know that there's a lot of people moving into fintech within Africa and in Nigeria. And so I just love to kind of understand who you think your main competitors are and the advantages that you have over other people that might be in this space. Thank you. Okay, um, our main competitors in the market we play um, is um, Verify Me, um, it's in Nigeria, and, and Smile ID. Um, the biggest difference between us and these, uh, and these competitors is because, um, number one, uh, we, we operate a very large ecosystem of field verifiers, which I mentioned earlier, which uh, uh, Smile ID doesn't have, but Verify Me uh, is building one. Um, we, we, we also have what we call a case management and decision management system, which none of them do have today. Uh, so uh, this this allows this this uh, basically stand us out, and and that also is what most of that's why we're very strong in the corporate banking world, uh, because um, and that's what the value that we deliver is regulatory compliance to them is safe and secure, and that gives us the edge uh, uh, when compared to our competitors presently. And, and before we go on with additional questions, I do want to note to the audience that you are able to make commitments and invest now. So click on that invest button if you're interested in Govenga's business and we'll do a uh, introduction. All right, who, uh, thanks for that question, Jennifer. Uh, Sarah, it sounds like yeah, uh, you're yeah, next. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi Govenga, thank you so much for that presentation. And um, uh, so this is obviously, KYC is incredibly important as, as Jennifer mentioned. I, I'm curious sort of from a regulatory perspective, how you assess sort of the risks and regulatory changes, you know, in Nigeria around KYC, around the banking system, uh, it be, you know, not just FinTech, but, but I understand that if I understand you correctly, you're applying KYC across various marketplaces. Um, can you talk about that, please? where the government sees this okay um the well, first of all in nigeria we ensure that we're complying with all the regulations which include uh, in nigeria particularly is the nida um, um, ndpr rule uh, and and, and the, all the other market have a similar regulations which we are presently in compliance um, of we are 100 in, comp in compliance and also because we are also in, in, integrated to nips uh, which is um, which which is our all some of the banking data. So so because of that, um, we're in full compliance with existing regulation. And so um, any other regulation that is either being in discussion, for example, open banking regulation, we are also part of that discussion to make sure that as those regulations or or, or policies are fine tuned, we are part of that decision. 
Thank you. Um, great, great pitch. You know, what you're doing is actually very near and dear to us because Stonks could be a customer as well down the road, right? We have KYC and AML um, uh, all over the world. Um, uh, so there are, I mean, there are other providers in the space, right? And I'm curious if there is, what is there something specific about Africa uh, or, or certain markets like Nigeria or South Africa or, or Kenya that gives you sort of an information edge or a processing edge that global players that like Stripe or others um, or other smaller KYC shops are not going to be able to do because they're based somewhere else? Uh, yes, uh, because, uh, for example, um, as part of this KYC process, there are some data sets that um, um, the likes of Stripe cannot provide. Well, one of them is address verification. So how do you verify an address where uh, the data literally do not exist? Some places do not even have a physical address. So because we have created a very large ecosystem in our markets, so uh, which basically like uh, on the like Uber-like type of ecosystem of thousands of units, uh, which have an app. So uh, basically, if um, and they will have to replicate it to compete with us. So it's those kind of value that we bring on board that is extremely difficult for uh, um, other people to replicate because they have to go through the same thing we went through. Uh, it's not just technology; it's also a lot of operational know-how and also making sure it meets the uh, the regulatory requirements of today and all, and also tomorrow. And so that's one strategic uh, value that we bring to the table. Another value is, uh, like I said earlier, is our decision management engine. Because we are, we're, we're, we've been working with these banks and uh, we know the market. So uh, our decision and, and risk profiling is already, uh, is, is already mature for our market. And so, and, and so and as I said earlier, none of our competitors offer the same service. So uh, they will also have to go through this uh, journey for them. And it's a very long, painful journey for them to reach that level. And so it's, 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 it's not impossible for them to, um, to create, but um, we have been able to execute uh, faster, better, and we we'll still believe that regardless of that decision to enter a market, we can comp compete favorably. Can I ask a follow-on question to that, Jim? Please do. Oh, yeah. So uh, can you talk a little bit more about the address verification side, which is which is very interesting, and I, I can see it as a competitive edge because many people don't have addresses. Uh, what... Do you have any partnerships with, you know, other technology companies, whether it's sort of, you know, drones or anything to find out addresses? Or is this like a people, people, people operation, which also could be a competitive edge, uh, although an expense, a competitive edge for people sort of literally like walking the streets, taking pictures. Google Maps isn't quite as um, accurate when there are house, there were no street names and house numbers for the unbanked particularly. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. The way it works is that we basically uh, help um, uh, make an ad. We, we acquire agents um, by basically it's basically a job, like a contract job, um, and they can just download the app, uh, go through an onboarding process and training process and quality assurance process. And when they download the app, we know them and we we send them in on um, an onboarding package so that they can identify themselves as our agent. And when a customer requests for address verification. We basically look at them um, and basically we send them to the closest place so they don't have to even drive there, they can just walk there. And so um, we're able to verify addresses uh, without uh, almost anywhere in our market without actually being there. So because we most likely have our agents there and, and, and they use their own local uh, knowledge to identify the place. So even if we put a description uh, in the, on your phone, because we're sending the address verification request to somebody local, uh, they are able to figure out where that place is and they will take the GPS, they will take the picture of the location. They basically create a proof of address for you and, and it's all done in the app and they upload it and we'll send it to the customer uh, in, a, in a regulatory compliant manner. So, so, just, so this also has the opportunity, if I understand this correctly, to essentially help bank the unbanked or get credit for the, those who don't, you know, I mean, there are other potential use cases. I understand maybe not, they're not your focus right now, but if we, if you can find, you know, addresses and verification um, uh, for for individuals who currently don't have them, do you see other use cases in the future for, you know, uh, helping those people? I don't know who the market market is, but love your thoughts on that. 
Yes, actually. Uh, for example, last year during COVID, uh, the government wanted to do so, a lot of um, social intervention uh, and help the poor. Well, these poor don't have proof of address. And how do you profile somebody that you don't even know? So uh, they have to reach out to companies like ours to do that. And so that was why uh, um, during the COVID, during the lockdown, they had to access our services uh, to even, um, because the government don't even have the data. So they have to access our service to be able to identify these people and, and even create a file, like uh, they are, where they live, for example. Um, yes, so, and there are so many use cases. So what we try to do at UVFR is to um, quickly wrap up those use cases uh, because we don't know, we believe that those use cases, uh, the more we develop these use cases, uh, the more we can uh, increase our top line and um, sustain our margin. So uh, related to that, we have a question from the audience from Dan Block from Mercy Corps. Uh, do you have exclusivity contracts with your commercial banking customers? What percentage of their KYC activities are performing today? Are you performing today? Uh, Okay, presently we don't have exclusivity. The only bank we have exclusivity with is Standard Chartered today. Um, uh, the, the other banks, um, for different reasons, use different platforms. But uh, uh, as again, you know, we are only two years uh, through this journey. As, um, as it goes on, we believe we will be able to capture more market. We do have exclusivity with uh, Standard Chartered, though. We have exclusivity with Gold. We have a, 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 exclusivity with some, we have 50% with some banks. Um, so different percentages. Thanks for that. Thanks for uh, Dan for your question and uh, encourage uh, additional questions. Uh, we'll either ha read them out or uh, potentially bring you on stage as well. Um, so, uh, so one of my questions is really around geographic expansion. Can you tell us a little bit about your plans for geographic expansion, if there are any? Okay. So one of the things uh, we have is that because we provide some uh, fantastic service to some Pan African companies in Nigeria, so uh, they want this kind of service in other countries. Um, so uh, it will be a good example is both. Uh, they want the, the only place they have a, that type of service in the world is in Nigeria. They don't have the service anywhere else. And they've approached us to replicate the services in all their markets really. So, uh, so um, and the same thing with Senate Charter, we, the service we offer. So basically we've structured our expansion with, uh, with, with, the, with the customers that have approached us to expand uh, to those markets. And so we were presently uh, integrating um, and in discussion with customers in in in, in Cote d'Ivoire, in South Africa, in Kenya and Tanzania, um, as 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 part of we already have customers that we are talking to there, uh, we are already talking to identities authorities there, um, so we yeah, so we already have that as part of our roadmap. Very right, no, interesting. Um, yeah. Jim, yeah, so I I've, I've got a question with respect to data security because you're obviously you know, um, uh, holding very important information and data about people's lives. And I think any CEO right now has got a lot of questions with respect to data security and how you protect that. How do you see that? And what are you doing um, to build a business that keeps that in mind as, as you continue to grow? Okay, so one of the first things we did is to identify um, uh, regulations and policies and standards around data security and make sure that we are in compliance with those standards. Uh, because, um, uh, so so we are ISO 27001 and ISO 27018 compliant. So we basically institutionalize data security first. And then we started making sure all our, all our team members and make sure we have experts in house about data privacy and data protection. It's not just uh, the technology, also like a conscience uh, let me put it like that to make sure that we don't become Facebook. Let me put it. So, so we also have that in house, and and so and we also make sure we design our product uh, with uh, privacy by design. That means that we design it in such a way that we we deny ourselves access because we don't want to be tempted to to do that. So it's so it's so uh, the fun, at the fundament at the foundation of our product is already designed to be in compliance with the likes of GDPR, NDPR, and almost at every existing data regulation is, I think, supersede those regulations. And so so it, it, so whenever we go to a new market we're talking to or we're being audited, uh, we make ourselves even available for audit. For example, we make ourselves available for audit but for all our customers. So when we started, we realized that the commercial bank we, we demanded to audit us, for example. And because we've already checked those boxes in terms of data security and compliance, it was very, very easy. And that's one of the competitive advantage we have. That's why even though competitors are coming to the market, um, they, are, they are like quick startups that might not meet these regulations because maybe they, 
prioritize other things, but we prioritize this. And so it's so we typically check the boxes. And so it's, uh, and it's, very, it's much, much easier for a bank uh, for that is under significant regulatory cover uh, to use our service. Uh, so when foreign um, uh, uh, companies in the developer, like in the in EU, you come to Nigeria, it's much more safer for them to work with us than, than some of our other competitors because we're already in compliance with these regulations. So and so and they also uh, make sure they do a third party audit on us, uh, which we have always passed. Thank you for that, Gavenga. Well, great. Well, love to hear the uh, investor panel's um, views on this investment. Would you invest? Are you clicking on that like button now? Ali, um, yes, like you have I, yes. I, uh, yes. So I click the like button, and I, I, I would, I would love to get an intro to set up more, set up uh, a follow-on, uh, do a deeper dive. I think this is pretty cool. Uh, I have a bunch more questions. Uh, probably not enough time to go, go into all of them here, but um, um, I think it's, 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 it's pretty cool. Good job. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. Sarah, Jennifer. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be very interested in this. I actually have looked at. At, uh, I just want to congratulate you on the progress you've made. Uh, given, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I, I looked, I've looked at this a couple of years ago with a, a different uh, with a different hat on, and uh, um, you know, I, I think uh, yeah, I think that's great. I think it's great. I'd be happy to be introduced. KYC and bank rotation is such a huge problem, not yeah. just in Africa but throughout frontier markets. So, if you're able to crack that, Jennifer. Yeah. Yes, no, I, I I agree as well with what Ali and Sarah have to say. I think what you've done is fantastic, and it's certainly it is a deep need in the African market. And I love the fact that you're you're on the ground. I love the idea of people boots on the ground going through and verifying um, all of this. So yes, I certainly would love to learn learn more and have an introduction. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Great. And for those in the audience, uh, if you're interested in an intro and investing in you verify, click on that uh, invest button and you will get an intro. Um, and uh, the poll that was just launched, the results of the poll, I don't know if we're showing this on screen or not, but uh, if we can, that'd be great. But uh, you got a great reaction. Um, you had over 95% of the audience say that they would invest something. Um, so congratulations, yes. Gavenga, for a great presentation and best Thank of you. luck in the follow-ups with the, um, with the investors who have expressed interest and, Thank um, you. awesome. And, uh, you know, I can't see this on screen, so if you don't mind, uh, how much uh, did we raise or how much, uh, you know, intros were requested 20 K well, congratulations, Gavenga, for, um, getting some interest for you, for your company. Thank you very much. Wonderful. All right. Well, now we're going to head over to our next company, Mike Quinn from Boost. Welcome, Mike. Hi, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for I'm having glad me. Glad to have you. And um, I just have to plug your book for a second while we're, we're here. Um, this is for those of you in the audience who haven't read this book, Jennifer Ali Moise. This is a fabulous book. Yeah, very open, honest, and very real. So thank you for writing it, first of all, and thank, thank you. you for sharing it with us. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write this book? Yeah. Um, uh, so the past 10 years before Boost, uh, I was um, running a, a, one of the first fintech businesses in Africa um, that grew to tremendous success, but ultimately um, failed to win. Um, and as I left, I was realizing um, how we were actually winning the entire way. And, and uh, it was every a bit of success we had was the result of just failing and failing and failing and failing um, until we had a breakthrough. And then I, I started thinking about, well, how, um, you know, how might I take this ultimate like failure to get like the big unicorn exit and, and achieve like the long lasting enduring success to launch another business. And it was really just a process of reflection um, and trying to, to capture the lessons I learned um, to design my new company. And then it, it turned into something that I wanted to share with others. Um, but thank you for uh, thank you for supporting it, Jim. No, great. Thank you. And then on that note, then we'd love to hear about your new company. So over to you and you have five minutes to present. Cool. Thank you. Um, so Africa, as we know, is a big, diverse and young continent with more than 100 million entrepreneurs who provide food and essential services in a trillion dollar informal economy. I've spent my entire career as a purpose driven entrepreneur in Africa including 10 years building one of the continent's first fintech platforms, 
that raised $35 million in venture funding and scaled to process $2.5 billion in transactions for 2 million active customers. Boost is my sequel based on what I learned from that experience. We are building a pan-African retailer-first commerce platform to power growth for the underserved entrepreneurs who are creating sustainable jobs and income for the future. Meet Blessing, an entrepreneur in Ibadan, Nigeria, who is a retailer for Unilever. As an unbanked small buyer, she struggles to keep her shelves stocked and pays higher prices for the products she needs. She also doesn't have enough working capital to buy what she can spell, or sell, especially during demand spikes. 4,500 kilometers away in Soweto, South Africa, Copano is an entrepreneur who started a business buying products from big wholesalers and selling to a network of small retailers like Blessing. He has a storage space and two delivery trucks, but shares Blessing's struggle to find the quality stock he needs at a sufficient margin and with payment terms to match his cash flows. Despite operating in different markets and at different nodes of the supply chain, Blessing and Copano are united in their quest to sell more of what their customers want when and where they want it at great prices. As an introductory product, Boost provides them with a radically easy stock ordering experience embedded in the familiar WhatsApp channel. Ordering with Boost is 10 times more data efficient than using an app, which really matters for our cost conscious customers. Our route to market starts with supplier partnerships, such as N1 in South Africa and Unilever in Nigeria. With volume, we have proven that suppliers will give us a 5 to 10% margin along with payment terms for bulk orders. We then enable distributors like Copano, who already own logistics assets and serve networks of hundreds or even thousands of retailers. We have validated that distributors will pay us 1% to 2% service fee for digitizing orders, invoices, and delivery routes that result in cost efficiencies and improved retailer retention. Once retailers order regularly on our platform, we introduce our second product, Stock Boosts. Stock Boosts enable retailers to order the products they can sell and pay for them over the course of the month for a service fee of 3 to 5%. Martha is our inaugural Stock Boost customer in Ghana, and she grew her monthly order value by 3.5 times and is now expanding her shop. We have been in stealth mode for over the past 18 months, first developing and testing our platform in Ghana, and then learning how to extend it to South Africa, Nigeria, and Egypt. During this period, we have raised $1.5 million and ramped to a GMV annual run rate of 3 million with 35% month-on-month growth. Setting up a Pan-African platform business during COVID has only been possible because of the deep experience and broad networks of our founding team. We are a group of multi-time founders with domain and market expertise and long-standing relationships. We operate as one boost using the same platform and model adapted to fit each local context. There is no doubt the African commerce ecosystem is heating up, but the market potential is enormous and still at a formative stage. Most companies in our space are positioning along a spectrum of asset heavy supply chain focus versus asset light retailer focus. Boost is pushing the boundaries with our asset light approach, but we really stand out from the crowd with our multi-geography strategy. We have designed our technology platform and capital efficient operating model with the focus goal of scaling everywhere to achieve the biggest possible outcome. And we are just getting started. With this investment round, we will be onboarding a captive audience of 4,000 female entrepreneurs in Nigeria who are responsible for 5% of Unilever's turnover. After a proof of model, Unilever's senior management wants us to quickly expand across West Africa, while we also brought in the product basket by bringing on other suppliers. We will also be expanding a high potential pilot in Egypt's huge and underserved fruit and vegetable segment, which we have validated through early testing. By the end of 2022, we will grow by 10 times to at least $3 million per month in GMV, with Egypt offering upside potential. We are targeting to take 10% of this as revenue with a 50% gross margin after paying fulfillment partners. We are also projecting to reach EBITDA breakeven in South Africa and Ghana on less than $750,000 of investment in each market. In the future, we plan to monetize our transaction data and layer on additional services to and through our expanding retail channel. We've allocated the nest $1 million of our $2 million round using a safe at a $15 million post money cap. Our last raise in May was at a 10.5 million post money cap. And since then we have grown our monthly GMV by three X. This will be our last safe round before a bigger institutional led series A in 2022. Don't miss out on this opportunity to be part of building the future of African retail commerce. 
Perfect timing as well, Mike. Thank you very much for the presentation and for the incredible growth metrics uh, so far. Uh, well, over to the uh, angels. Who'd like to go first? Um, I'm happy to go first. Um, thank you so much. Very, very, very interesting. Um, lots of questions that I've, I've got and, and looking forward to hearing more. Um, uh, as you know, too, I mean, Africa is a very diverse place, right? Diverse people and diverse cultures and also to diverse languages. Could you give me a little bit of an understanding of how you handle that across this platform, which, you know, goes over multiple countries and, and geographical areas within Africa? Sure. I, I've got my team with me, so I'm going to hand that over to Will, our CTO and co-founder. Hi, everyone. Pleasure to, to be on today. Yeah, great question. And, and that's really kind of one of the questions we thought about at the outset in designing boost like from day one it's a multi-country market multi-market model uh, and so from a product and obviously by association of technology perspective we embrace all of those those differences and bring them together in one boost in one platform uh, and leaving our our kind of teams that you're here from in peter and joseph on the ground to enact that in in terms of like local operation so really the platform is designed to you know be easily translatable easily pluggable we have a very modular multi-tenant solution that allows us to say yes we absolutely need a different payment solution in ghana than we do in south africa than we do in nigeria uh, or maybe that's a delivery solution so modularity and, and multi-tenancy is our secret source there great cool. thanks for that um did i answer your question Je jennifer yeah Yes, yes, that was very helpful and good to hear that it's something that's very much so embedded right from the beginning of your technology. Yeah, one, one thing I would add as well um, is that um, we, we rely on like very strong experienced co-founders in each market um, that have like real ownership incentives. Um, and so we have uh, Peter who's in Lagos, Joseph in Ghana. Both of these guys have decades of experience in startup um, with brands like Coca-Cola, uh, mobile operators. And so they, they're they responsible for really making sure we adapt and localize the, the model and product offering. Following up um, on that question, just, you know, taking any a specific market, I presume this, this is true across different markets. What are the main bundles of uh, partnerships that you need for, for each market? Uh, for example, whether it's the logistics, it's warehousing, it's, um, you know, credit, you know, uh, who's your fintech partner, et cetera, their phone company, digital money, what? How, how are you think about this? How do you bucket it? And is that sort of driving how you're picking which markets to go to first? Peter, can you maybe share Nigeria? Okay. Uh, um, thanks, Sarah, for the question. I think the, the approach varies per market. In Nigeria, if I think about the bundles of partners we need, first, we would need supplier partners who would be the ones to manufacture the product. We also need distribution partners. In this case, they provide warehousing services. Uh, some do delivery, some don't. Then we have logistics integration. And we also have payment partners that help us to digitize the, the collections and ensures that uh, whatever stock boost credit we're given, you know, that there's less leakage in the system. Now, for our markets, we've been, uh, we've been I won't use the word agnostic, but we've been very open. We know partnerships is key. Uh, I've leveraged experiences over the years. I mean, I've been in the FMCG almost 20 years. So when you think about the industry, who to go to for logistics or for payment, you know, even if it's in the fintech space, we have those those relationships. And what we are currently doing is we're not even locking in. So we're almost like, a, call it open source. So we're talking to like the likes of Paystack, Paga, OnePipe, so that at the end of the day, we're not restricted and we have, you know, the, the type of scale or coverage we need because the, the market size is large. Yeah. I would also add, Sarah, that um, in terms of market selection, uh, so South Africa, Egypt and Nigeria are the three largest markets on the on the continent. Um, Ghana is one of the fastest digitizing uh, markets on the continent, and it was it was a really friendly place to test and develop the model. Um, but we believe that we have something that we can we can replicate and start expanding, you know, go go deep in the current markets we're in, but then package it in a way that can really expand quickly into other countries and, and go after a much larger uh, addressable market and build like a diversified business that way. And there's a related question from Mark Rose, uh, which is a good one. Uh, why is pan country more important than a local model as you're starting your business? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll take that one. It's it's such a great question, um, and it's a lot of this is built on um, the the you know 
the failure that we ultimately had at my former company, um, Zona, where uh, we went really deep into, into Zambia and Malawi, raised a whole bunch of money and then tried to expand, um, which I, I think is, is critically important in Africa, where you have a, a fragmented um, continent with lots of markets and, and local contexts. Um, and you have quite a lot of concentration risk in, in any one additional or individual market, like including the big ones like Nigeria. Um, so like we believe as, as a philosophy that um, uh, a pan-African multi-market approach um, is, is critical to achieving like a, a multi-billion dollar outcome and shielding ourselves from the risks of any individual market. Um, but it's only possible to be able to design for that from the beginning. It's really hard when you are overly localized in one market. Um, and so and part of the just the model that we designed and, and being in service um, to our, our founders and, and different countries is to really think through how do we uh, modularize the business so that we centralize the, the scaling assets such as raising capital and building technology and systems and operations and then localize all the things that need to be localized with um, very strong co-founders like Peter and Joseph um, around go-to-market strategy, partnerships, acquisition. Um, and so we think we have a winning formula with this. Yeah, that diversification aspect of it, especially when there is instability in, in many of the markets is, is really important. Indeed. Uh, great. And, and uh, any other questions from the angels? Otherwise, we have a few more from the audience. Um, just a really quick one, uh, Mike. I'd, I'd love to hear sort of the story of why you got into this. Why Boost? What was the personal personal problem or, or situation that compelled you to go like, hey, I, I have to solve this problem. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, I don't want to plug my book, but I think that was probably the, the foundation of it. Um, uh, I, I'm Canadian, um, but I, I moved to Africa in 2003 to first to Ghana and then to, uh, to you know, to Zambia. And uh, um, first of all, I, I uh, firmly believe that my privilege um, is a responsibility to um, to be of service, um, you know, and, and, and help build up the continent and build up the ecosystem of entrepreneurs. Um, in terms of why Boost, um, it was really around uh, this, you know, core belief that we all share on the team that small retail, or small like retail businesses um, already are the backbone of the continent. 76% of urban jobs come from small businesses. Um, and the population is growing at a rate that Africa is going to have 2 billion people by 2040. And it's a moral imperative to actually help these businesses um, grow, create jobs and income, become part of the digital economy that's emerging. Um, there's a huge business opportunity as part of that. But I, I think for all of us, this is, is much more of a mission than just building a, you know, building a company that we can have a good economic outcome at the end. Like we, we will have that by achieving the scale that... Um, you know, that matches the size of the problem, I think. Thank you. Actually, Mike, and, and on that, I mean, it's clear that on a personal level, right, that there there's a real impact, you're, you're driven by impact. And that's something which I think is so fantastic. And could you tell me a little bit more too than about ultimately kind of the end users? And I would imagine that the vast majority of them, are they female? Are they, you know, can you give a little bit more? Do you track the impact the ESG, the sustainability that's part of your business? Joseph, can you take that? Yeah, majority, actually more than 80% of our uh, retailers are uh, females. Um, and even for the minority, you, when you go behind, you find that there is still a female involvement. It's a, often a, a household investment between husband and wife or a single mother who owns the, the shop. Um, so that's mainly what it is. And majority of them are also uh, youth. Um, we find this a little skew about, let's say, 44 uh, years of uh, age, but um, men, uh, uh, young women um, or single mothers uh, who are doing this as either um, a main um, source of livelihood or uh, another way to just uh, supplement the income of the, of the family. And to, to add to that, so what we actually track, I think that the growth of their businesses is the ultimate objective because then it's about their quality of life. It's about ability to afford, you know, a, a bit of standard. In addition to that, we, we do a lot of development with them. So um, just the, the, the visibility they get from using the platform then teaches them how to do proper accounting, bookkeeping. They understand stock. So it also helps uh, improve on their uh, business acumen. Um, I think uh, down the line, based on some of the partnerships we are getting into, 
There's also funds that come in from some of those companies for secular reasons. So either to, to do reverse logistics, waste management, and they get involved with add extra income, but also ask them to become uh, more socially uh, responsible. So all in all, it's more very impact driven over and above the commerce. That's great, we, uh, thank you. We're also the ones bringing them um, to the um, digital world. Um, and many of them have never used any digital platform before. So all of the offline, and so we are now giving them this that they can leverage uh, for uh, financial services um, later, which is also embedded in our offering. So, so there's, a, there's a great question from Bade Aluko uh, in Nigeria. Uh, there are quite a few startups in the space in Nigeria, and by the way, in other markets as well. Uh, why are you not recognizing them as a competitor or as competitors? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, um, I, I was going to say we actually do recognize them as competitors, but the way to look at it is this, is why, why do we have a reason to believe we would win? So um, firstly, is um, when you think about our strategy, we've been very focused on asset light versus heavy. Uh, a bunch of our competitors have been making investment in infrastructure and warehouses and trucks. That makes them quite slow to scale. We don't have that as a challenge. Uh, the second thing is, when we look at the space in which Nigeria exists and in terms of just the opportunity, over a million retailers, over $40 billion in FMCG revenue, um, there is enough for quite a number of players. So we are not there yet. I don't think we've been able to capture up to, I'm talking about the total uh, amount of players, up to 40% of the market. So I don't even see them as competition because there's just so much we can do. If you think about rural coverage, if you think about semi-urban, there's a lot that is happening in that space. The other area is that um, with the kind of partners we have and the kind of proposition we have, we're sure that we're able to land and leverage the relationships to get even, um, I would say, some of the key suppliers, like the case for Unilever, because we have access to those partnerships. Uh, a strong USP for us, beyond the fact that we are enabling the women grow through credit, which not all of them are given, is that our technology is actually more efficient. So if you think about apps, they're data heavy and they're tech savvy heavy. With WhatsApp, everybody's on WhatsApp. We are even having language adaptations which we can flex. So we're probably able to get into areas that they can because the women have a less barrier of entry by just the app. So net net, we don't see the competition for those reasons. I, I would just build on one thing too, of like the, the multi-market strategy we have that um, you know, now we're, we have localized, um, you know, competition and we all find our niches. But if you fast forward, you know, three to five years, um, when the businesses that are, are centralized in one market or one region um, are raising a lot of money and trying to figure out how to expand, we will already be there. And, and uh, just a, an example of like we spoke to somebody who was uh, at Gojek last week in Indonesia about how um, when they were starting to expand, they raised a billion dollars and their platform couldn't even do multi-currency yet. So like the, the, the investments we're making now to um, spread out and make sure we, we have the technology and the teams and the model to get multi-country, I think will, uh, will be a big strategic advantage for us um, in the future when everybody else is trying to figure out how to do it. Great. Well, thanks for that. Love to get uh, the, the investors panel's um, feedback on. Would you guys invest? What's, what's the next step here? Ali, Sarah? Um, I can go first. Uh, I, uh, I, I'd have to dig into the space a little bit more. I'm not as familiar with the space. And so my circle of comp this is outside like my circle of competence. Um, it's also an atoms business, not a bits business. So it takes a little bit more uh, sort of uh, getting comfortable with the space. Uh, but I think the team team looks amazing and uh, uh, I can really feel sort of the mission driven energy that you're going at this with. And, and so much of early stage investing is about people, not about uh, you know, uh, 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 even before it's about product or process or market. So um, uh, I, I will take a deeper look at this. Thanks, Ali. Great, great. And I, I echo your your comment about um, early stage investing and how it's really about the people and people who can execute. So um, second that for sure. Sarah? Uh, yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Mike. Thank you, everybody, uh, for the for the very insightful um, introduction to the to the company and a little familiar with Zona. So I, I and I'm also a big believer in learning from failure and I'll, and uh, I wouldn't really call it necessarily a failure because I think you had 
some copycats and others who came in. So from a larger <laughs> perspective, from a personal uh, perspective, it might feel that way, but I really look forward to to reading your book. And that's the first thing that I would do is sort of read it and, and try to understand how you reflect on that journey and what you've learned. And I think if you're applying that to this new business that, that uh, I'm assuming you've You've learned a lot, and this is definitely a, a first-rate team that at least is with us today, and I'm sure there's even more depth that doesn't fit on the screen. So I would love to learn more uh, about the company. Yeah. Great. And um, Jennifer? Yes. No, I mean, again, uh, following on from what Ali and Sarah said, I mean, a fantastic team, incredibly skilled, and this is an area that I, I actually really am uh, am focused on, and, and I, I love the, the mission-driven, the purpose-driven um, nature of, of what you're doing and in particular to the, uh, I, I can see the incredible impact that it would have on, on women in particular, being able to connect them digitally. You know, I, I still have lots of questions and I, I could probably go on for a few hours with you on different things, but I certainly look forward to speaking with you offline and learning a lot more too about your business. Thank you for your time. And you'll be able to do that, um, uh, obviously, and all of the others who have indicated. And I see that you guys are over your target. So congratulations on that. Um, and I have to say, I, I, I'm, I'm very impressed with your presentation and the team, and I'm also pitching in a check as well. So look, looking forward to the introduction uh, and speaking further in detail, and perhaps Jennifer, um, Ali, Sarah, we can do a joint call together. Yeah, I would love to. Jim's investing. Uh, I, I, I want to know more, and I got to read your book. Yeah. I'd, lo <laughs> I'd love to do a call. I'll plug it again. This is the third time. Yeah, I'll, absolutely. I'll give, you, I'll give you my copy when, um, when I'm done, Ali. I look thank forward you. to it. Well, great. Well, thank you, everybody, for uh, taking the time and all the angels and all the entrepreneurs for taking the time to, to pitch today. You know, don't forget um, that this is a introduction and uh, obviously we need to dig down into more details, but I really love the Stonks platform and that helps facilitate all of that after this. So I'm hoping that uh, these, this leads to some uh, very fruitful conversations for, for Mike, your team and uh, that you close some of those deals. And with that, we're at the top of the hour. Um, thanks to everybody. Don't forget, we host these uh, in-person virtual sessions uh, on a regular basis. Every month we do pitch sessions like, th like this. And our next event is actually going to be in Cape Town, South Africa, where we're gonna host investors from around the world uh, to drink and be merry and, we'll, and with some of the top fund managers and startups from South Africa. Um, and Cape Town's startup ecosystem. You can find out more at untapped.com or untapped slash theglobal.com or follow us on LinkedIn and make sure you get notified of our events. You can follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter at untapped global. Thanks everybody. Have a good week.